أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه وأزواجه وذرياته وبعد مفتي من حاج جزاكم الله خيرا for that very wonderful and inspiring introduction this is not the first time I've been here this is like my neighborhood masjid mashallah so I come here very often and uh, Mufti bin Haj Masha has a very beautiful quality. He is like a mama bear, you know, with the ulama. The ulama are like his cubs, and he's very protective. And he really, mashallah, like, if you try to mess with anyone, try to mess with any of the teachers at Dar Salaam, you'll see his claws come out, and you don't want to see that. So, inshallah, be nice. Everybody behave. Behave because Mufti Saab is a very respectable person. If you don't respect him through being good to him, I fear that you may have to learn to respect him the hard way. Uh, the other thing is, I think I suspect one of the reasons that the, the, the introduction was so long is I've been told lunch is going to be a little bit late, so we had to kill, <laughs> kill a little bit of time. So the truth has come out. Mufti Saab has good akhlaq. Lunch is late. Now we can start with the, the actual program, inshallah. I forgot to announce, inshallah, just for the record, our Zuhar will be at 1.45. 1.45. So the topic I was given is a topic that has to do with an intersection of a couple of concepts in Deen as well as history. And the concept in Deen primarily starts with what? It starts with the idea of innam al-a'malu bin niyat. All actions are according to what? According to their intention. So this was a very important uh, presentation that Mufti Muhammad bin Adam was giving with regards to parenting. The whole idea is if you just teach your children to become Muslims out of habit or if you m force them to pray because they're afraid of you or because otherwise they're not going to get candy or allowance or not going to be allowed to you know, play with their friends and all of these things, what is the benefit of that? Is there any benefit of it? If your intention is the child is doing something for an intention other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sake, is the child going to benefit from that uh, act of worship? Absolutely not. This is an idea that is very simple, but unfortunately it has missed many people. And one of the reasons it has missed many people is you will see we're, look, we're sitting in a masjid, it's in a kind of a quasi-neo-Ottoman style that the masjid is built, one freestanding dome without any pillars on the inside. And it has, mashallah, wonderful calligraphy that is uh, made by hand by artisans that came from overseas. In style and form, it's very similar to a classical masjid. The people look around, the person to the left and to the right of you, everybody is dressed up in their medieval vestments and garments with their beards and with their, their heads covered. You know, when the people drive down North Avenue and look, there's a bunch of a bunch of freaks from a time machine got together and sat down. But the sad fact is, I wish we were the freaks from the time machine. Unfortunately, the reality is what? Is that the outside is different. It looks freakish. The inside is almost no different than what's on the inside of other people. Who can blame us? We have lived in a place and the effect of that place has dyed us and has colored us. And deen and iman is built on rationality. The very Arabic language which was chosen for the Qur'an to be taught in is, is an Arabic language. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He describes the relationship of this Arabic language with the Qur'an. إِنَّا أَنزَلْنَاهُ قُرْآنًا عَرَبِيًّا لَعَلَّكُمْ تَعْقِلُونَ We made it in Arabic Qur'an. We sent it down as an Arabic Qur'an so that you can be people of rationality. You can be rational people. You can understand what, what, what the logical connection between things are. The English language is the opposite of Arabic in so many ways. And one of the most basic qualities of the English language is completely irrational. It's completely irrational. You cannot learn English grammar. Somewhere around the 70s in America, they stopped teaching English grammar to children because it makes no sense whatsoever. So what happens, you just learn it, like, you know, from, from, from talaqi, just from listening to other people speak, you learn how to speak as well. It's an extremely irrational language. Arabic is a very pre precise language, and it's a very rational language. English has so many strata of grammar that are, that, that are acting at the same time. You have the actual English language, which is the Anglo-Saxons, the, the language that they spoke. So if you want to see what that language was like, go and look up Beowulf. 
right? It's an old, it's an old uh, uh, epic tale about, you know, the slaying of, 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 of Grundle, some sort of weird demon figure, and the heroic epic tale of Beowulf. It's a completely unintelligible language. You won't understand any of it. So okay, impose upon that the stratum of, of Latin, impose upon that the stratum of French, impose upon, the, impose upon that all these kind of weird loan words you get from Celtic and all these other languages. It's completely a mixed up and confused pot. And it's an example of what? It's an example of the confusion that pervades the way we think and the way we think about things is the way that we do things. So like in Urdu, there's a very uh, interesting saying in Urdu. They say some people like to grab their nose like this. Some people like to grab their nose like that, you know. I guess the, the result may be the same, but one is a more direct and logical way of doing things. Now tell me something. Is it haram to harm another Muslim? Yes. Is it haram to harm another human being for no reason? Yeah, it's haram. It's, it's, you're going to get a sin for it. If you keep doing it, you don't repent. It may take you to the hellfire. Okay? Is it far to kiss the black stone in Hajj? No. But still half the ummah is having the royal rumble, WWF brawl, and trying to beat down, mashallah, the nations of the earth, and screaming Allahu Akbar as if they're like whatever, like about to like break the idol of Hubal inside of the Kaaba or something like that. Why? Because there's no, there's no rationality in the mind anymore. There's no ability to understand what's more important, what's less important. One of the greatest foundations of the deen is what? إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ All actions are according to their intentions. So this is something, it's a very simple concept. You say, oh my goodness, look, he did like two bachelor's degrees in philosophy and all this like 20 minute introduction from Mufti Minhaj only to tell us something that we already knew. The fact of the matter is we all know it, but still nobody, nobody's implementing it. Guess what? Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala on whom they implemented it. They understood intuitively and they implemented it. So when, according to the prophecy of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they conquered the nations of the world, they implemented these, these small and simple pieces of understanding that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave in very amazing and in, in very uh, 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 awe-inspiring ways. So one of the ways that they implemented this, this uh, uh, piece of understanding is what? Is that when somebody says to you, Islam was spread by the sword, in one way they're telling the truth, in one way they're, they're not telling the truth. How are they telling the truth? The fact of the matter is, is that the Roman Empire, the Persian Empires, they were both unseated by the armies of the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum. And subsequently, the Muslim uh, governments that ran under theocratic rule, meaning rule by the Sharia itself, they unseated a great number of nations. In some ways, the entire world system that's there, the UN, the WTO, all of these different economic and political alliances, they're all there to ensure that that, that never happens again. But that's a different topic. It's neither here nor there. You can disagree with me if you want to. And who, really, who cares? That's not really what we're talking about right now. If people don't understand the basics, then to talk about that system is a complete pipe dream. Yes, the Muslims unseated the Romans as tax collectors. The Muslims unseated the Persians as tax collectors. They unseated the Romans and Persians as givers of law. In the Roman law, uh, a man who marries his wife, his wife becomes his property. He can literally kill her and the police is not going to come and say anything. Why? Because she's his property. In the Persian law, a man can marry his sister. Prophet Rasulullah told the Sahaba specifically when you go to the Persians, if they wish to keep their religion, that's, that's their thing. We're not going to force them to convert. But this one specific practice that they have, you're to end it by force. The system of governance, the system of economy, right? One of the greatest sources of slavery in the, in the Roman Empire was what? Was debt slavery. You know, for example, a person goes and takes a mortgage out on their house. If you can't pay it off, they would literally sell you as a slave. You would forfeit your freedom and you would have to pay off your, your wage through the price of your own uh, freedom. Uh, these types of things, yes, they were ended by the sword. And this type of corruption and this type of zulm, oppression, people do not give these things up except for by force. They implement them by force and they are only given up by, the, by force. They live by the sword and they ultimately will die by the sword. This is a, a reality. 
This is a reality. Nobody, no zalim. If a person is going to be a person who lies and cheats for a living, a person who's built his entire empire, built his entire business by lying to people, cheating people, coercing people, that person is not going to do what's right because you asked them too nicely. Do you understand what I'm saying? So from that point of view, those economic and political systems of zulm, the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum ended them. And the Muslims ended them wherever they found them traditionally. Unfortunately, now we have people with beards and with turbans that propagate these systems of zulm. Traditionally, the people with the beard and turban were the ones that they knew that those people were scared. When they see these guys coming, that's it. The jig is up. That, that system is going to be ended. But if someone tells you Islam is a religion spread by the sword, it's completely and patently false. It is completely and pat patently false. Why? What's the point of making somebody f uh, convert to Islam at the tip of a sword? If a'mal or bin niyat, if, if all actions are according to their intention and you force somebody to convert at the end of a sword, is their conversion going to be worth anything in this dunya or in the akhirah? Absolutely not. It's absolutely going to be 100% and totally worthless. There are places in the world where conversions were done like that where mass conversions to a religion were done like that, and those conversions sh are, are to this day uh, uh, either washed away or completely and patently unsincere. This is a small part of history very few people know about. Iran, which is a, a country that has become synonymous with uh, uh, Shiite theocratic rule, Iran was, for most of the history of Islam, a, a country that was a majority population of Sunnis. You have people like Imam Ghazali, you have Fakhruddin Razi, Imam Muslim. These people are all Iranians. Uh, they're all Iranians and they're all uh, great ulama and thinkers of the Sunni tradition. Even Persian literature. If you look at per anyone here, uh, studied Mufti Riaz, maybe he's still here. So anyone here has studied Persian literal, literature? All the canonical poets of the Persian language. Persian has a very rich uh, 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 language of, of literature, most of which has to deal with spirituality and Islam. All of the canonical poets of the Persian language, they're all Sunnis. Jalaluddin Rumi is a Sunni, right? Hafiz, is, uh, Hafiz Shirazi is a Sunni. Sheikh Saadi is a Sunni. All of these people, these are all, these are all uh, uh, people of the Sunni tradition. Iran, what, what happened, right? There was a, uh, a, a, a heretical sect uh, that, that, that essentially as an act of political violence against the Ottoman Empire, they were, they were a group of Turks uneducated Turks that said we're going to become Shia just to fight against the Ottoman Empire uh, and that was the beginning of the, the, the Dola of the Safawiyah right? they called them Qizilbash which means in, uh, uh, Turkish uh, uh, redhead, they used to wear red hats and they became Shia just to, just to have some sort of religious propaganda in order to build their state and they took over Iran and they forced converted everybody uh, in Iran to uh, Shiaism by force, by force that's why the Shias that we have in the Indian subcontinent are very fervent. They're very religiously fervent people in their Shiaism, right? The Shias in Iran are completely irreligious people. Why? Because it was forced down their throat. If you go to Iran or you see Iran on the news, they don't seem like they have all this, uh, this kind of clerical class that's ruling them, but the average people seem to really not like them. Why is that? It's because people force them. If someone is, has to do something by force, whether it's right or wrong, a human, a human being, their jibilla, the nature Allah Ta'ala created them on is what? Is that unless they want to do something, if you try to coerce them to do anything, they're just going to be half-hearted in it. And in the dunya, for Iran, it seems to work. Maybe they still have their country. I mean, politically, it's still viable, right? In the akhirah, if somebody is doing something and they're not really, their heart is not into it, if they're going to come to Allah Ta'ala and say, yeah, well, I just prayed and fasted because other people made me do it. This is a sign not of Iman, this is a sign of what? Of Nifaq. It literally comes in the hadith of the Prophet wasallam that certain people when they enter into their graves and the angel Munkar and Nakir ask them, you know, who is your Lord and what is your religion and what do you say about the Prophet wasallam? they'll literally answer and say, we don't really know, we're not 100% sure, we just used to say what other people used to say. Because that's a time that a person is not going to be able to tell a lie about. So coming back to the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, Politically and economically, they, they imposed the hegemony of Islamic rule over a great number of lands. The Ottoman Empire and other uh, empires, Abdul Rahman al-Dakhil, Banu Umayyah, and Andalusia, all of these different places. They imposed political and economic uh, uh, hegemony, supremacy of Islam in these places. Which sounds kind of like daunting to like non-Muslims, but it was really actually quite a good thing. Why? Because in Europe they had something called the feudal system, 
where you have a king and his relatives, they form the, the noble class, the, the noble class that own land, and everybody who's not part of that noble class, they're either part of the clergy, either part of the church, or they're regular people. So the few people who are part of the church, they are exempted from taxes. All the regular people, they have the burden of taxes, and their, their, their freedom is tied to the land that they live on. They neither own the land, neither can they live, leave that land ever. They're doomed to work that land, work that land, work that land. What ends up happening is that the, the produce from the land, the crops that they, that they uh, harvest from that land, they will keep a small percentage of it, and a majority of it will go to the feudal owner of that land. So how do you think economically these lands were? Were they very highly productive or were they not? They're utterly a catastrophe. This is why Europe was in the dark ages. The feudal system was still in, in place in France until what happened? The French Revolution happened. Anyone here read about the French Revolution? Anyone? Was it, was it a peaceful thing? Absolutely not. Washed the entire country in blood. So many people just killing so many people out of the collective and suppressed rage and anger of centuries of zulm. Of centuries of what? Zulm. France was, they called it the bride of the church. France was one of the most practicing Catholic, dependably practicing Catholic countries in Europe. And it was one of the last seats of political power for the Catholic church. But even, even France, because of the zulm that the church was complicit in regards to the feudal system, even France is now one of the most accurately secular and, and anti-religious countries in all of Europe. Why? Because the zulm, the oppression, it's like a spring. You coil it up more and more and more, and bam, it pops one day, and uh, that's it. Then everything is going to fall apart. That, the anger of that, 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 that coiled up spring snapping, that anger will not leave haq or batil. Everything it will destroy. It will make complete and total chaos to the point where now you have entire nations of the earth where the belief in God itself is considered to be a joke. Even though Allah Ta'ala didn't commit the dhulm, the people committed it in His name and without His name. This is by the way an important, these are all important lessons for us as Muslims. Why? Because Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, you will follow the people who came before you, hands breath by hands breath, to the point where if they go into a lizard hole, you would go into the same lizard hole like they did, just because they went into the same lizard hole. And unfortunately, this is what our community is doing as well. So beware, someone say, oh, I'm never going to rule a country. Yes, I've seen how you guys run things. You're probably never going to run a country. But you will run your local masjid. Be careful not to make zulman people on new Muslims and on, on women and on minorities and on you know, peop, po, the poor attendees of the masjid, etc., etc. Lest you completely destroy your masjid just like other people destroyed their nations. What happened when the Muslims conquered places like what? Like, like, like Spain, like Sicily, like Malta, right? Like, like the uh, 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 Anatolia. You know what they call Turkey now? That's not where Turkey... Turkic speaking people are from. Turkic speaking people, where is their homeland? It's like Lake Baikal. It's somewhere between Mongolia and Siberia in the far northeast. They conquered these lands from who? From the Roman Empire. Why was the Ottoman state successful? You know when the Muslims conquered Constantinople, right? The, the, the title of this talk is Merchants and Mystics, right? Let's talk about merchants and let's talk about mystics. When the Muslims conquered Constantinople, which, is the, which was the capital of the Roman Empire, one of the reinal titles of the Ottoman Sultan, other than being the Amir al-Mu'mineen and the Khalifa of the Muslims, one of the reinal titles was that he's the Emperor of Rome. Why? Because he unseated the Roman Emperor. The Roman Emperor, for, until the, since the time of, uh, of, of Nero, was not somebody who was elected by the Senate. Rather, they were just military commanders that some of them unseated the other ones. And then the church got upset. These guys are Muslims. They unseated. Our, no, we're not going to let acknowledge them as the emperor of Rome. Literally, it's still the Roman Empire. The, the seat of it sits in Constantinople in its traditional capital. For more than a century, probably for about two centuries before the Muslims conquered Constantinople, all the lands in every direction from Constantinople was already under Muslim rule. The European historians, they say, oh, well, Muslims taking over Constantinople, it's not such a big deal because the city was so weak already. The city was so weak already, it was in decline for centuries. And the population had been declining, and the economic importance of the city was declining. And so the Muslims, they just did something that was logical. It's like we left it anyway. That's, they're taking it over. It's not a big deal. Why was the population declining? Tell me. Why was the economic economy of that place declining? Because now the people who are farmers and the people who are artisans that can produce goods, 
They have a marketplace where they can sell their goods and get a fair price for them and not get ripped off, which is where in the markets of Syria, in the markets of Iraq, in the markets of Egypt, the Muslims did what? They first straightened out the economic situation and then afterward this talk of conquest and this talk of changing religions, all of these other things happened. And you see literally a, uh, 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 an example for that in the modern time as well. Turkey is a very ex- a successful uh, uh, country you know, in, in, contemporary, in the contemporary political landscape. And it's one of the few places that are economically successful and also uh, amicable to Islam and to Muslims. The government that did this in Turkey, which is now politically so powerful and everyone resents them and whatever, you may like them, you may not like them. How did they become powerful? Did they become powerful for beating people up before being late to Jumu'ah? No. Did they become powerful because they uh, beat people up for not having a fist-length beard? No. Actually, as far as I can tell, their, their president, he do, he, he's clean-shaven. He doesn't have a beard at all. Did they become powerful? How? By making people uh, you know, come to the masjid on the 15th of Sha'ban? No. What is it? The Turkish economy was in free fall. The if inflation was so bad, every year they used to delete. If it was a good year, they would delete two zeros from the, from the currency. And if it was a bad year, they would delete three zeros. The, the, the exchange rate was literally like a ticker. Now they've stabilized the exchange rate. So if you want to buy a Coke, it'll cost you one lira. Old people in Turkey, if you ask them, right? Bir is the word for one in Turkish. If you ask them, how much is the Coke? Old man shopkeeper is a bir million. He'll say it's one million liras. Out of habit, because for most of his life, Coke literally used to cost a million liras. But now it's just one. They rectified what? Help people with their dunya first. And that what opens the heart up for, for you to talk about their akhirah with them. And coming back to the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, they conquered all of these places. They didn't force anyone to become Muslim. And forget about within their lifetimes, literally it takes two, three, four hundred years for a very slow and gradual process of converting people to Islam and bringing people into the fold of Islam until Syria, Egypt, Palestine, uh, 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 Iraq, all of these places become majority Muslim countries. So imagine the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, Sayyidina Amr bin Asr radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, is, is, is the governor over Egypt, majority of the Egyptians, that now we associate them with Al-Azhar al-Sharif, and we associate them with the beautiful recitation of the Qur'an. Majority of them are what? They're not Muslims, they're Christians. Majority of Syrians, Syria, we, uh, we associated at least until very recently with, uh, 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 with ilm and knowledge and with iman and with all of these good things, barakat and all of these things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helped the people of Syria from the difficulty that they're going through right now. That same Syria, it wasn't, it wasn't Muslim. Sayyidina Muawiyah radiallahu ta'ala anhu ruled, ruled from Damascus and a majority of the people living around him were not Muslims. Constantinople, Sultan Muhammad Fatih. There's a hadith of the Musnad uh, of Imam Ahmad and uh, of the Mustadrak of Hakim. Uh, it's a sahih hadith in which Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said one day Constantinople, لَتُفْتَحُنَّلْ 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 قُسْتَنْتِنِيَةُ وَلَنِعْمَلْ أَمِيرُهَا فَلَنِعْمَلْ أَمِيرُ أَمِيرُهَا وَلَنِعْمَلْ جَيْشُ ذَلِكَ الْجَيْشُ That one day Constantinople will be conquered. And what a wonderful commander will the commander of that army be and what a wonderful army will that army be. Imagine, mashallah, I got shabash from Mufti Minhaj, Sultan Muhammad Fatih got shabash from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ أَبَا أَحَدٍ مِنْ رِجَالِكُمْ وَلَاكِ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ وَخَاتُمُ النَّبِيِّينَ He's not the father of any of your men sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, rather he is the messenger of Allah. When he speaks, he speaks with the authority of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he is the seal of the prophets. He gave shabash to Sultan Muhammad Fatih. Left, right, in front of him, behind him, all of them, almost all of them are Christians. Very, very few, very, very few uh, Muslims with him. Majority of the people in Constantinople, Constantinople are Christians. Guess what? The markets of Constantinople for 200 years before Sultan Muhammad Fatih conquered the city, the markets were run by the Muslims. The Christian emperor said to the Muslims, come, please let your traders set up their markets in the city, otherwise the entire economy is going to collapse. And what did the Ottomans say? They said, we'll let you do that if you allow our qadi, our judge, into, into the market. Because you people transact in riba, and you cheat one another. Your feudal system and this other nonsense, you people are not reliable. You know how nowadays people say, oh man, I, I hate doing business with Muslims. A'udhu billah. 
They said, you know what? We cannot do business with you people. We'll send our traders and we'll, we'll, we'll uh, make your markets run, but let our judge, our qadi, come and, and adjudicate between people in their, in their disputes. Otherwise, we're not going to do it. He said, okay, come on, let them in. When Sultan Muhammad Fatih conquered that Constantinople, which was in population decline literally for centuries, what did they do? They brought in justice and they brought in fairness and they brought in what? The, the believer is somebody who's easy to deal with, easy to get along with, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said. So many ahadith about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what? They have to do with how you should do business with one another. There's a story, perhaps you have heard of it before. A person may wonder like, what's the point of a story like this? That a sahabi, he, he goes and opens up a shop, brings his material merchandise, opens up his shop, and he's buying and selling, buying and selling, buying and selling. After some months pass by, somebody buys something from him, and then a couple of days later, he goes, you know what, I don't like your product, give me my money back. So he goes, here, here's your money back, he takes the product, and then he starts taking the shop down. So what are you doing? He says, I heard the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say that whoever returns a transaction from a person after, uh, 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 even though they didn't have to do it, but just why? Because they wanted to just go easy on the person. He said, I'll give them the, the, the promise of Jannah. And said, I just wanted to be part of the bishara, the glad tidings of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I wanted to make amal on this. What do you know? This one thing, which sounds to you and me, because we think about what? Even though we look like, again, like from the pages of some sort of medieval comic book, but we're the same inside like other people are. So to you and me, this seems like what? This is like, what's the big deal? Walmart does the same thing. Well, guess what? Everybody's converting to the religion of Walmart now. Even our masajid are like Walmart. People say, I went to such and such place. The masajid are so beautiful. They're huge. And they have this class and that class. And you can learn to cook. And you can, there's a political action network getting together. And we're going to go to this protest. And we're going to do all of these other things. And the mayor comes and, you know, uh, eats samosas with us in Ramadan. And the senators eating gulab jamun on Eid. And this, all these things are happening. Our masjid is amazing. It's so vibrant. I said, Alhamdulillah, mashallah, your masjid is amazing. There's only one small thing missing that would make it nice. It's what? Just a little bit of deen. I don't ever hear anybody talking about deen. None of the kids have memorized the Qur'an. None of the, none of the children are reading the Qur'an. Nobody makes the dhikr of Allah Ta'ala. There's no students of knowledge. There's no one who stands up on the pulpit and speaks the haqq from the, from, from, with authority. Right? Who's the representative of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Al-ulama'u warathatul anbiya. The ulama are who? The heirs of the prophets. They're the next of kin of the prophets, the heir who inherits from you. It's not Bill down the road, it's your son, it's your brother, it's your father. The ulama are the, like the next of kin of the, the anbiya. I don't see that, I just see, you know, like a, a fulan uncle, doctor, engineer, activist uncle who doesn't know too much about deen, but he's going to tell us about this. I see those things. Now, what am I saying? Am I saying it's haram to have a big mustard uh, parking lot? Parking lot's wonderful. Mashallah, they opened up the other entrance uh, on the uh, swift road over here. Ever since then, I come here for taraweeh instead of other masajids because it's really easy to get in and out of. It's wonderful. What's wrong? Political activism is wrong? Absolutely not. Go and have gulab jamun with the, with the senator. You know? What's wrong? Is it wrong to have like classes for this and that and the other thing? Absolutely not. Learn how to cook, so archery. Uh, program code, you know, practice the SAT, the ACT, the USMLE, the DAT, the whatever else it is, the FBI, the CIA, whatever you want to do, you figure all of it out, the CBS, the NBC, you do all of it, do it all. But what's missing is just a little bit of Dean. That's the difference. The same return policy with Walmart is garnering people to convert to Walmart's religion, which is what? The money is going to save you. That same policy, if the, the NIA is for the service of Islam, the idea is what? That, that same return policy literally can make your dunya and make your akhirah, both for the one who takes the return and for the one who, who receives it. Why? Because that person is also going to think like, wow, this person was so good to me. They did ihsan to me, even though they could have ripped me off. Now their ear is open that they're going to hear something about deen. Look at the flip side. The British ruled over the Indian subcontinent for how long? 300 years, maybe excess, more than 200 years though. 
right? So 300 years ago will be like 1717. The Mughal Empire still had some, some reign, although maybe that may not be that far out, off the mark, actually, now that I think about it. But complete rule over the subcontinent without a challenger is 200 some odd years. How many, how many people in the subcontinent are Christian right now? Almost nobody. Illa man Allah, almost nobody. Why? Because you cannot show up to somebody's country and be like, here, let me rob everything that you have and treat you like garbage and whatever. And here's the gospel, by the way, Jesus uh, you know, saves. It doesn't work that way. You take your Jesus and get lost. We're, we have nothing, no connection with it whatsoever. We have no connection with it whatsoever. Obviously, we wouldn't say that because Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam is one of the anbiya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But this is, this is something that, for example, Hindus in, in, the, in the Indian subcontinent, they resent Christianity for that reason. And they say bad things about Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam because of that reason as well. Even though they don't know that these people are not the ones who represent him, alayhi salam. The idea is if you come to people like that, they're not going to change. What was the thing that changed people? The merchants of the Sahaba, the merchants of Yemen. Is there anyone here Yemeni or of Yemeni origin? Mashallah, Hyderabad, most people who are like old Hyderabad families, you have some sort of Yemeni either relative or, or background. Why? Because the merchants of Yemen, did you know that Islam came to the southern part of India before it came to the northern part of India? Why? Because the merchants of Hadramaut, they used to trade. There's an entire arc. If you look from like Tanzania up through uh, Kenya, uh, uh, Somalia, Eritrea, uh, uh, and then that arc s- sweeps through uh, South India, and it sweeps through all the way to the Indonesia, Malaysia, the archipelago of the... Uh, of uh, the South, Southeast Asian archipelago, Indonesia and Malaysia, which are by now the most populous uh, Muslim countries. What's the, what's the country that has the largest Muslim population? Anyone know? Yeah. Wrong. It's actually India. That's a problem for some reason. We can talk about that later. But the most populous country that's officially a Muslim country is Indonesia. Actually, India has more Muslims than, than, than Indonesia does, despite the fact that it's a Muslim minority country. But the uh, trick question, anything I say, always assume it's a trap. Always assume it's a trap, and you will survive. Feel lulled into a sense of comfort. That's when I'm going to get you. So the, 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 that whole arc, what is it? It's Yemeni traders, it's Yemeni traders that went from, uh, uh, you know, literally there are people who took their business with them and they say, I'm going to do business and I'm going to use it as a way of serving the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anyone here from Seattle? Peanut butter, mashallah. You know Imam Joban, right? He's, he's the oldest scholar in the, in the Seattle area. He's the first one there. I don't know anyone before him who actually had formal training. He's a graduate of Al-Azhar al-Sharif. Uh, uh, he used to give, I remember, uh, Quran, Tafsir. People used to come from like 100 miles around in every direction to hear it. Imam Juban, did you know that when Sheikh Qasim, who studied in Hadramaut, came back from uh, study in, I think, 2012 or, or 2011, right? I took him to meet Imam Juban. I thought, okay, he's a new graduate. He should meet all the Imams in the area. Let's, let's have them meet each other. He told me something I never knew before. When Sheikh Qasim said, I graduated from, from the uh, Madrasa uh, Darul Mustafa in Tarim in Hadramaut, Imam Juban said, you know, my great-grandfather was from Tarim. <laughs> he said, my great-grandfather was Tarim. And what happened was there was a Sayyid, he was a Sharif, a, a, a descendant of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who was an Alim. And he named, I think, Aydrus, one of the, the famous tribes of the Sadat in Yemen, of the Ahlul Bayt of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Yemen. He said, this, this, this sheikh was a, a great da'i and a great merchant. He was, a, he was an alim, he used to call people to Islam. He would figure out where in the world people are Muslims, and he would just pick one place after the other and keep hammering away at that, that place until the people become Muslims, and then he would uh, uh, pick another place. He just, the whole thing he did in his life. And so what happened, he said that, that this Aydarus, he went to some island somewhere in, in, in Indonesia, and what he would do is, once he would manage to convert the entire like, set of villages in an area, he would then take some young people, the intelligent young people from them, and he would take a trip and go back to Yemen. And then what would he do? He would take them back to Yemen, s- sign them up in madrasa. Then he would go and, take the, uh, go and visit all the other traders and all the other merchants, and he'd say, you know what, we, we got to build masajid. These people are new Muslims. We need to build masajid. We need to bring, build houses for the ulama. We need to build like a, 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 a khanqa for the people to make zikr. We need to build a library, all of these things. And what would the merchants do, right? Nowadays, what do the rich people do in our locality? They'll say, oh, okay, bring me PowerPoint presentation. 
book a room at the uh, Drury Lane or in the Monty, the Shalimar, the Hilton, Marriott, spend $30,000, hire a comedian, as if the deen of Allah Ta'ala is supposed to be some sort of a joke or a laughing matter. Hire an entertainer. So one time someone asked, are you going to so-and-so fundraiser? I said, man, uh, that's expensive ticket. It's a $100 ticket. How am I going to go? He said, no, no, fulan so-and-so is going to sing nasheed there. I said, for $100, forget about singing nasheed. He better dance. But unfortunately, like, that's, that's the way we do things. We don't, we don't want to do it the old way. You know, the way that was successful, that worked for our forefathers. We don't want to do it that way. What did he do? He gathered all the people. He said, this entire place, they all be- accepted Islam. People would be amazed. Said, this is amazing. This is wonderful. He said, we need this in order to propagate the Islam forward. And so he would raise the money. Then he would go to the madrasa. You see these uh, Dar es Salaam kids who are going to graduate today? He said, bring me, bring me, like, you know, talk to the mashaykh, bring me the aman, the, the, I mean, the, the trustworthy ones amongst them, the sharp ones, the smart ones, intelligent ones, who are ready to make sacrifice for the sake of Allah Ta'ala, who are ready to uh, 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 do something with their life for the sake of the deen. And he would gather them together and say, come, we're going. You're never going to see your home again. We're leaving. Omar, are you ready? Amr Mustafa, are you ready? Where are you? Hazm. No more PlayStation. I don't know if you have it in the first place, mashallah. No more. That's it. Ice cream, all that stuff is done. All right? You're going to go where? You're going to go to Indonesia. Not the really amazing Indonesia nowadays where everyone's a pious Muslim drinking coconut juice. In those days, they used to be cannibals. You know that? Right? You want to eat ice cream? Dude, they want to eat you. Okay? I'm not... Has them raise your hand, everybody, right? I'm not, I'm, not, uh, I'm not a cannibal. I don't like eating people. But if I did, Hazem would look really tasty. He'd, he'd probably be the tastiest looking dude in the entire, uh, in the entire Dar es Salaam. There's some other people, I don't want to embarrass them, call them out. They, I wouldn't want to eat them. But Hazem looks like he's a very tasty guy. Okay? That's it. You're going you're gonna to do this? You ready? That's it. Your mama's going to say salam to you. She's going to see you at the hold, man. That's it. Done. Okay? So he would gather this money together and gather these people together and they would go to that place. Then he would supervise the masjid is built and then he would stay with those people and teach them, okay, this is their custom for this, that and the other thing. This is the chief of the tribe. This is, you know, the, you know don't you know, tell this person this thing, otherwise he's going to get upset. He set them all up, get the madrasa running, get the local children learning Quran, all of these things. And then he would leave and go to the next place and do the whole thing over again. This is not just one person who did it. This is literally Khalaf and an Salaf people again and again and again in every place they did this. Not just the Hadramis. Hadramis are very proud. I sat in a taxi cab one time with a Hadrami. Uh, not this time. That guy was an interesting guy too. Uh, sometime before, you know, the, in, in Hajj on the 10th of Dhul Hijjah, all the roads are blocked. He says, don't worry, I know Makkah Mukarramah like the back of our hand. I, he said that, he said that Makkah, alhamdulillah, two things that we are, we're proud of. One is, we're, Makkah Mukarramah is filled with our people. And the other thing is that the world was filled with our people. There's no place that our people haven't gone and taken la ilaha illallah to. It's a source of pride for them. Makes them, makes them happy with themselves. You know, just like how some people now, oh my beta, my son is a doctor. Even more than that. Right? ashaddu hubba lillah. The people who believe, they have even more fervent love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than the kuffar have for their kafir material type stuff. So what happened? This is a project, it doesn't require governments to support you. It doesn't require armies to come to you. Right? Who is merchants and mystics? We talked about merchants. Who are the mystics? They're the people of dhikr. They're the people who would go as a stranger. The people who are loved and celebrated amongst their people. They'll go amongst the people who don't know who they are and they don't know who they are. People who know nothing about Islam, nothing about Iman, nothing about any deen whatsoever. They'll show up as a stranger and start calling people toward Islam. The name, the name Khaja Mu'inuddin Chishti, Rahimahullah Tabarak wa Ta'ala. Chishti is mashallah, it's a, it's a city by Herat. Those are places that have been in the fold of Islam since the time of the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum. Herat probably has the, isn't that right? The Herat has the graves of Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum. So, and he himself is a Sayyid, he's Ahlul Bayt of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa In a time and age, people used to respect that a lot. He, what, he went in order to propagate the deen to where, to where Mufti Azaz is kind of from, right? Where is that? Ajmer, right? You guys, your last name, Ajmeri, right? Ajmer was a place absolutely had nothing to do with deen. Now we hear about Ajmer and we think, subhanAllah, Dar Salaam, 
right? We think about MSI. There was a time people didn't used to think about MSI when they heard the word Ajmer. Complete kufr. I mean, not just like, you know, one thing is there's churches and synagogues. We're talking about idol worshippers. We're talking about people who eat human feces, some of them. We're talking about people who don't wear clothes. We're talking about people who, they have no idea about who's Allah and who's His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa Okay? Tell me something. When Khaja Muinuddin Chishti came to uh, Ajmer, was Ajmer under Muslim rule? Absolutely not. The army came after he did. Khaja Qutbuddin Bakhtiyar Kaki, his disciple, right? Who, who, who was one of, who, during whose time Delhi was conquered. Delhi became like the capital of the Muslims. People now, it's New Delhi. Delhi is a place where you get a roast beef sandwich. Delhi is the, the, this, the, this city, it was a Misr min Amsar al Muslimin. Kufar were not allowed to live there. They would come in the morning and leave at Maghrib time. It was a city that had literally hundreds of awqaf, masajid, madaris, libraries, uh, public free hospitals, all of these things. Who came first? Did the army come or did the, the, the people who brought the, the deen with them first come? The people who brought the deen, they all came first. The armies come later. This work is not the work of the armies. This work of putting la ilaha illallah in the hearts of people it happens only one at a time. It's not the work of militaries. It's not the work of armies. Do you think, do you think, that you are going to be able to come with the niyyah of taking from somebody and that they're going to accept the deen from you at the same time? The fact of the matter is, majority of us, majority of us, we're either immigrants or we're the children of immigrants. We're either immigrants or we're the children of immigrants. And if it's not the case now, because mashallah, we've been suffering for pietitis, you know, for the last three, four days now. So we forget like what, you know, what niyat we made in the past. Majority of us came to this country to make money. Someone might say, oh man, I'm born and raised here. I'm not here to make money. I'm, I'm born and raised here. We still have a chip on our shoulder against, against the system, against the man. They enslaved my forefathers. They did. It was horrible. It was inhuman. It was a holocaust. It was worse than the holocaust. The people who died in the holocaust, they died. At least they know what their, the names of their fathers are. The people who were brought here in chains as slaves to this country, they, they, they literally separated mother from children so people don't even know what their names are. Why is Malcolm X Malcolm X? Because he sure as hell is not Malcolm Little. Who knows who the name of their father is? Do you know how difficult that must be? Still, we see in our Salaf, there's, there's a precedent for how to deal with this situation. If you want to be one of the dunya, you can take the revenge of the dunya. That's the law allows you that. If you want to be one of the Ahlullah, you have to swallow all of that and, 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 and raise yourself to a higher standard. You know, uh, anyone here been to Lahore before? Lahore, anyone? Right, right? Data Darbar, you've been to Data Darbar, ate the free, mashallah, sadaqa, deg of zarda and biryani and things like that, right? So, Data Ganj Baksh, Ganj Baksh, Fez Alam, Mazhare, Nure, Khuda, Kamil Ara, Naqisara, Pire Kamil, Kamil Ara, Rahnuma. The Sheikh, he actually wrote a book. It's called Kashful Mahjub. Mashallah, nobody reads it. They just go and like do weird stuff at his grave. But khair. The book, in, in the book, it's one of the earliest books that, that's written on Tasawwuf, right? He himself was from Ghazni. He's a Ghaznavi, which is again Central Asia. And he left also for the same reason, that he wanted to also be like these pious people and spread the deen of Allah Ta'ala. You can read in his book how he's like, you know what, it's really difficult to be here. Like you can tell the, the difficulty of what he's doing is like wearing on him. He has a slight amount of annoyance that, you know, I've left the, the lands of Islam and now I'm in, I put myself in this difficult position. But he still, mashallah, he kept it real. He did his thing. Allah Ta'ala reward him. Um, he writes the story in the tabaqat of the mashayikh of one Muhammad Khair and Nasaj. Nasaj is like, uh, Nasaj is the one who does embroidery, right? So his name is, the sheikh, his name is Muhammad Khair. His name is Muhammad, his father named him Muhammad. The story that he had was that he was from, I think, Kufa or Baghdad, and he saved up money. Obviously, you know, the zikr type people don't make a whole lot of money usually. Some of them do, but most of them don't, right? So he saved up his money for, for, for quite some time, and he wanted to do what? He wanted to go on hajj. Right? He's not going to Hawaii, he's not going to you know, go skiing, he's going to go on what? On hajj. That's a pretty pious thing. He's already a pretty pious dude, and he's saved up his money to do what? To go on hajj, okay? On his way to hajj, he st the caravan stops in Basra, which is the other big city of Iraq. And what happens? 
the, uh, there was a man who calls a police officer and said, this is my runaway slave, his name is Khair. And the police officer grabs him and shackles him and they drag him by force to this guy's house. So the sheikh, he says that, you know, I, I didn't know what was going on, but I figured, you know, I made the intention, I'm on in the path of Allah Ta'ala, going to the house of Allah Ta'ala, so there's some khair in this, I'm just going to go with it. So he said, I just served him quietly for three years, until one day he himself had a breakdown and said, you're such a pious person, you know I was lying, but you never said anything bad to me, you took such good care of me, you showed so much love. He said, he made tawbah, he repented from his... Uh, he repented from what he did and he let him go. He let him go. Someone might say, well, uh, you know, Alabama and Mississippi sure as hell didn't let us go. Well, yes, that's true, but at the same time also it's not like anyone forced, uh, forced people in America to abolish slavery. For whatever reason, good or bad, it was something that was done. Why? Because of the appeal of the haq, not by the force of arms. But the, the point is not that. The point is not that. It's, all of those things are horrible. What this guy did was horrible. What the, they did in the South was horrible. The, the, the point that I want to bring up is what? Is that for the rest of his life when he would ask, when, when, when people would ask him what his name is, he would say, my name is Khair. And the people who, would ask, who knew him from before say, why do you tell people your name is Khair? This is like the fake name this guy gave you uh, based on a, 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 a lie, based on a false accusation that you were his runaway slave. He said, you know, uh, I, I thought about it also, and I preferred the, I preferred the name that uh, Allah gave me over the name that my parents gave me. Which is what? What does it mean? It doesn't mean that the guy, what he did was right. right? In the Sharia, we know it's very patently what he did was haram, it was wrong, it was a lie, it's a dhulm, all that other stuff. But the idea is nothing in the heavens and the earth happens except for because Allah Ta'ala wants it to happen. And there's some good in it for you. If somebody is driving home and their car gets hit and totaled, nobody wants that to happen. Allah Ta'ala protect everybody from that happening. If it happens though, if you're a person of Iman, you should know and you have a yaqeen inside your heart, there's some good in it for you. Now imagine, now imagine, okay? If a pious or righteous, you know, Hyderabadi uncle or Arab uncle calls an American person to Islam, what effect is it going to have? And if a pious and righteous person calls somebody to Islam through his good akhlaq, that person knows that, that my forefathers did dhulm on you. How much more impact is it going to have on them? Allah Ta'ala put every single one of us in the position that we're in for a reason. The work that, that was there that the Sahaba radiallahu anhum did and that our forefathers did in terms of spreading the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that work is not contingent on government, it's not contingent on masjid boards, it's not contingent on, 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 on foundation in Villa Park or MSI or Dar es Salaam or any of these wonderful institutions. We love all of these institutions. Right? It's not contingent on them. If there's just you and you have La ilaha illallah inside of your heart, you can, you can literally go out the door and use, use it somehow to benefit somebody, to benefit yourself as well. That's going to be a work that's going to be heart to heart. And it's going to have two things, right? Merchants and mystics. One thing, is the first component it's going to need to have is what? You will have to do something in order to benefit someone's dunya so that they can listen to you and, or entrust you enough to listen to you when you tell them that you're going to benefit their akhirah. That's the merchant part. The mystic part is what? It's an extremely difficult task. Why? Because you and I, economically, you have the underhand. In terms of government, we're not running the government. We're underhand. We have the, under, the lower hand. We have uh, socially, right? People are nice. The nicest of the people, when they see us, they say, okay, don't be racist against this guy. Inside, they're saying, that, uh, he's Muslim, but I'm sure he's the, one of the good ones, right? We have the deck stacked against us. We have the underhand. The only way, and what are we trying to do? We're not trying to be even with people. We're trying to what? Give to them. We're trying to be in an upper hand in order to give them something. This, the math doesn't work out. The only way you're going to be able to do that successfully is what? Is to tap into a source of infinite power and infinite help, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the mystic part. If you're not a person who your salat is, not just you're praying five times a day, you know, Allahu Akbar go up, Allahu Akbar go down like the merry ground, right? Uh, if your, your salat is not something that you're actually getting something meaningful out of with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if your recitation of the Qur'an, you're not getting something meaningful out of it with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you're uh, fast fasting, you're not getting something meaningful out of it with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you don't hear the rem reminder and the remembrance of Allah and His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it doesn't bring a tear to your eye, you're not tapped into it yet. 
you have to start with step one is you have to tap into it first. It's not easy. It's itself a difficult thing. It involves giving up haram. It involves, uh, you know, uh, praying your, your, you know, doing your, your, uh, discharging your obligations properly and then doing more and more and more until your heart, the rock breaks and the living part of your heart emerges from underneath it. If you cannot tap into that, all of this is like a pipe dream. It's like you're uh, in third grade and someone's telling you about calculus. Drop out of that conversation. Maybe you can keep it as a goal for like a long-term goal. Go to those people and go to those places that will help you do what? That will teach you the dhikr of Allah Ta'ala, teach you the name of Allah Ta'ala, so that when you say it, it affects you and it affects other people. And then once you're there, you have to keep that up. You have to constantly tap into that source of power. It's the only thing. Other people will die from depression. Other people will die from anxiety. Other people will die from frustration. There are many people who will give you a long fiqhi discussion of why you, know, you, don't, you don't have to pray on the airplane, but the real reason inside their heart they're not going to pray is because they're afraid, oh my God, like the white people are going to look at me. Which is fine, it's an anxiety people have. If you cannot get over it, then the other stuff is, you, know, you probably shouldn't be running for Masjid President at that point, and you probably shouldn't be giving Jummah Khutbah. You should work on yourself a little bit. Right? This anxiety, the only way you're going to get over it, the only way you're going to get over this economic uh, 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 handicap and this social handicap, this political handicap, the only way you're going to get over these things is what? Is that you have this connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's the one that he, what? When the Sahaba radiallahu anhum entered the, the, the majlis of Kisra of the Persian emperor, they said these are like lizard eating people. They smell like camels. They came out of the de desert. Who the hell are they to tell me that, you know, what religion I should follow and I'm the king of kings and all of this other stuff. And what happened? Allah ta'ala trampled their entire mulk under the feet of the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum. Why is that? Because they tapped into that source of infinite help. That's the thing you cannot spend money to break. There's no bulldozer that can break it. There's no army that can conquer it. There's n nobody can do anything about that. That's the thing when even, even the army of Fir'aun is bearing down on, on, on that thing. All it's going to do is going to make it even more spectacular when the sea swallows them up. If Kufr could have ended the deen, don't you think there were centuries, centuries of plots and schemes, not starting from Abu Jahl and Abu Lahab, Right? Starting from the Awaleen, from Ad and Thamud, don't you think there are plots, centuries of plots and schemes to end this thing? People would have, the nations of the earth would have loved to get together and ended this thing. But the thing is, they can't fight with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you're with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they can't fight with you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq. We have to enter into our hearts. Uh, ikhlas and sincerity for Allah and his for Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam for the Sahaba radiyallahu anhum to carry on their work sincerity for our neighbors that we can't resent them we can't call them names even the dude with the Trump sign in his lawn you know you have to have say what I hope Allah Ta'ala gives this person something better you can't you can't ha yeah, the first thing is you have to yourself if you want them to fail then how is Allah going to help you make give them hidayah it's just your dua is well your heart is making dua constantly for this person to go to jahannam Right? You have to want this for yourself, your children, you have to want this for them as well. Right? If, you want, if your children are themselves going astray and they never learned to read the Qur'an and they never sat for the dhikr of Allah Ta'ala and you never woke them up to Fajr because they have to go to school because there's a pep rally for the football game in the morning or whatever, uh, uh, then how are you going to want it for someone else if you don't want it for the ones you love? You have to have this ikhlas for everybody. It's a really big burden to carry. You have to strengthen yourself in order to carry that burden through what? Through the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our mashallah, wonderful and pious people like Mawana Tamim and others like him, inshallah. You can talk to them about that. They'll help you with that, inshallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give all of us so much tawfiq. Wa sallallahu ta'ala rasuli Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam ajma'in. I would go on, but uh, Hafiz Faraz is kind of, he scares me a little.